Doctor Martínez Checo, vamos a dejarlo con la conferencia de Senolytics and Senotherapeutics. So, so we're, this is the last conference of the day. Afterwards, we're going to have a, a Q&A with the speakers, and then we're going to have a cocktail if anyone wants to join us. So I'm going to be talking about senolytics and senotherapeutics. Uh, I know Dr. Lee mentioned some of it in his talk, um, but I think it's very important to just go into a bit more detail in terms of you know these upcoming emerging strategies. So. Let's talk about cellular senescence. Let's talk about senolytic compounds. Some review some of the clinical data. We have clinical data in this too, and then just detail how we can integrate uh, senolytics, senotherapeutics into our practice. So, again, aging process. It's a gradual process of cellular organ and t tissue and organ dysfunction. Sort of a hierarchical process. So everything starts not working at the cellular level, and then obviously that translates into tissues and organs. Um, I mentioned in my other talk the hallmarks of aging, so we know there's many things, mitochondrial dysfunction, stem cell exhaustion, telomere attrition, all that is working together to affect and make us age. Um, aging is the major risk factor for chronic degenerative diseases. I mean, that's One would think that's obvious, but it, it must be stated. I mean, aging is the issue. Um, and as we age, we accumulate senescent cells. And I, I think this is very important. Um, again, going historically, Alexander Pope, hundreds of years ago, said, disease is a kind of premature old age. So again, even then, people were trying to make that connection between diseases and the aging process. So let's look, what exactly is cellular senescence? So it's a process, obviously it's a, it's a transition through which cells can, can go. It implies irreversible replicative arrest. These cells are no longer uh, dividing, they're no longer multiplying, they're not, no longer growing. Um, these cells become apoptosis resistant. So your body is having a difficult time getting rid of them. They just want to hang around and rejoice in their old age. And these cells acquire something that's called senescence-associated secretory phenotype, SASP. So the SASP profile of senescent cells is part of the problem. Uh, this makes them, they become pro-inflammatory. They become, they recruit locally. They start recruiting other cells to make them senescent, so it's a vicious cycle that starts at that level. Um, one of the things that we see, and I'll talk about this, but these senescent cells, they start accumulating certain waste products. So, for example, uh, BGAL is one of, the, uh, one of the things we measure, um, and that's something that's accumulated in old cells and not in healthy normal cells. Um, some other expression of proteins, P12, P, P21, P16, and others. So, we know that these cells have certain characteristics that make them different from uh, healthy multiplying cells. Um, when this happens, they get to that point where obviously growth is stopped and functioning decreases rapidly. So again, we, our bodies need to have healthy dividing cells all the time and as this happens, when they stop that, they basically stop a lot of their functions. Um, and that basically drives uh, aging uh, more so. Um, the SASP profile of these cells um, is accelerated. It damages the extracellular matrix. It accelerates fibrosis. It inhibits stem cell functioning. That's another thing. Senescence inhibits stem cells and actually promotes stem cell exhaustion. So not only do we have old, non-functioning cells, but then our stem cells cannot work properly. So, I mean, there's, you know, different ways that we can start looking at how to target uh, SASPs and an associated secretory phenotype. And I'll get into that a bit more, but I think some of the slides may be 
not in the proper order. I apologize for that. I'm not sure why. Um, but anyway, when we have uh, senescent cells, if we look at the cascade, the, we, we first need an, something to cause harm, some sort of effect that will damage the cell. It'll drive the cell into this process where there is a point where the cell can still be rescued and not become senescent, but then there's a point of no return. So that's one of the problems here that once these cells become senescent, so far we either eliminate them, we try to kill them, or they hang around. We don't have the capacity. I mean, it's being studied. There's some senescent reversible therapies that are being uh, investigated right now, but we still don't have them available. So right now, clinically, what we do have is uh, the use of senolytics. Um, but before I go into those details, um, there's multiple biomarkers that can be used to look at senescent cells. Okay? Like I said, one of the most uh, recognized markers is SP-GAL, beta-galactosidase, accumulation in lysosomes. But there's also a P16, P21, and then other SAS profiles. We currently have some labs uh, that can do this sort of assay. So you can, I mean, you can literally draw a patient's blood, send it to one of these labs, and they can give you a report showing BGAL concentrations, activity, uh, compared to healthy controls, and then see the sort of burden, senescent cell burden, that your patients may have. And obviously, at any given time, at any given point, um, we're all going to have some senescent cells hanging around. It just, it, it, it's just a matter of the balance. When we have an excess of senescent cells, that's when things happen. Now, when we talk about senotherapeutics, senolytics, it's an early stage field. There's a lot of growth in the longevity space uh, in terms of companies studying senotherapeutics, senolytics, senostatic, senomorphous, and they're all looking at targeting senescent cells, some of them eliminating them as senolytics, some of them inhibiting them, just keeping them quiet, not non-functioning. Some of them are looking at uh, blocking the SASP uh, component. So it's, it's actually, there's a lot of stuff that's being studied right now. Um, and it's also important to know that there's differences between senolytics and uh, senostatics. So senolytics are compounds that will actually kill the cells. Senostatics suppress uh, the functioning and growth of these cells and the recruitment of these cells. So that's a very important, again, terminology, but we'll see how, how it's and why it's different, right? So let's look at clinically options, um, you know, for senotherapeutics in general, okay? One of, one of, I mentioned this before, metformin, okay? It's uh, extremely well-known. Uh, anti-diabetic drugs been in the market for decades. Um, it increases mitochondrial ADP, ATP ratio. It modulates AMPK. Um, it's a downstream mTOR inhibitor. And, I mean, there's evidence supporting its use in pre-diabetic populations, and, uh, and we're getting to that point where we may want to, you know, because of the trials, we might, may eventually be using metformin with healthy populations. And I know a lot of you have used, have prescribed, or prescribed metformin. So metformin works at the, uh, it modulates AMPK from a signaling perspective. This is one of the important proteins there that has to do with aging, uh, tissue, cells, protein growth, cell growth. Um, and downstream, it'll affect mTOR. So we know that mTOR inhibitors like rapamycin and such go directly into that, but metformin does it in a sort of indirect manner. Um, as I mentioned, it's been studied for many decades. It's, you know, it's a safe pharmaceutical. Um, and now, you know, the studies have backed its use for age-related purposes. And this is a trial I was talking about. You can research this. It's a TAME trial. It's called Targeting Aging with Metformin. This is a nationwide uh, six-year clinical trial over... 3,000 individuals will be uh, a part of this. Um, it's led by Dr. Neil Barzilai from the, I think it's the, uh, it's in New York, I Einstein Institute of Medicine. It's one of the universities in New York. I forget where he's working at. But uh, this has the potential to see if aging can be treated as a chronic disease, and it has a huge potential as to how we look at aging. 
And again, this, you know, it, it, there's a lot of implications because medicine is constantly changing. We know that. And there's a lot of implications when, from a regulatory perspective, things change. I don't know if you guys remember, but, uh, you know, a few years ago, obesity was not considered a disease. You guys remember that? When obesity was just a condition but not a disease. So, and then suddenly, when it was finally recognized as a disease, we started having all these new drugs, all these new combinations. So the formal recognition of disease states drives not only regulatory, but it drives innovation because then, you know, there's an additional incentive into looking at a particular inter intervention. So I am, you know, pretty confident that in the next few years, we will recognize formally, again, aging as a disease. So um, for the TAME trial, they're looking at doses from 500 to 2,000 milligrams. Yeah. Usually, you know, when I, when I start patients on metformin for longevity purposes, I usually go on the slower doses and we do combination therapies with other drugs and, and nutraceuticals. But um, there's, you know, there's no optimal dose right now as to what would be that for metformin. Another uh, important uh, drug uh, in terms of senolytics is rapamycin. Um, it's, it's been approved for a while as a transplant rejection drug. I think it's used or was used for, as a code for coronary stents and uh, also was used to treat rare diseases. Um, it has immunosuppressive, anti-proliferative, and anti-inflammatory functions. Um, paradoxically, again, the lower doses and the changes, it can have immunostimulatory effects. And, you know, in, I've, I've used rapamycin for quite a bit, and in my experience, it's a, you know, again, the doses we use are different, but it's a much, it's a very safe drug. It's, I think it has had a bad rap, <coughs> perhaps at the higher doses for the rejection. But um, for the low doses for longevity, it's actually quite, quite safe. Um, one of the things that rapamycin does is it blocks what we call geroconversion. So when you have that cell that is it, at that point where it can eventually become a senescent cell, no way back, point of no return, rapamycin could actually block that. So that's it becomes sort of like a, so, well, it basically, I'd say it drives radio conversion, so no static, if you want to call it that. Um, it inhibits cell proliferation, but preserves what we call repro reprolifer proliferative potential. So basically, it keeps cells in a quiescent state, but they can still grow and multiply and divide. Um, so that's why, again, we, we consider it perhaps a more of a senostatic than a senolytic. senolytic. It's not necessarily killing the senescent cells, although it can also uh, impact SASP phenotype. Um, usually, it's dosage-wise, it's been used in different dosing ranges, usually from two to six milligrams, even lower doses, one milligram. Um, I've actually had even micro-dosing rapamycin you know, on a daily basis with other uh, senostatics or senolytics. Oh, i show this already. Um, these were mice treated uh, with senolytics, and um, they saw a median lifespan increase of 27% just by killing the old cells, just by killing the zombie cells. Um, there's many different pathways that can be targeted in terms of that point of no return with, uh, with senolytics, and there's different compounds that can have senostatic or senolytic potential. So we spoke about rapamycin. I'm going to talk about the DQ combinations, the satin of quercetin, and also fisetin. And I think, um, you know, there's very interesting options there. Um, the satin of FDA approved from chronic myeloid leukemia and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It has, as a standalone, it has very limited senolytic activity, but when you combine it with quercetin, and this was done with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, com models, we're looking at these combinations. When you combine uh, the satinib with quercetin, you get a really good senolytic effect. Quercetin, the same thing. It's a plant flavonoid, a polyphenol, antioxidant. It activates certain proteins. 
found in fruits and vegetables, um, it's not a standalone cellulite, but when you use it in combination, it does the job. So the DQ combinations, the satin and quercetin, whenever you see DQ, just it, we're talking about this, the DQ combinations have shown interesting benefits, and we have a few clinical studies. And, and this is very important because, you know, as, as a, maybe as opposed to other treatments or, or other options that we're exploring where there's no clinical data, we actually have a few clinical studies on the satin and quercetin combinations for uh, senolytic effects. So one of these studies, uh, they use DQ in uh, patients with uh, diabetic kidney disease. Um, this was, uh, it was actually back then, 2009. It was a satin of 100 mg, quercetin 500 milligrams BID. That was a three-day course. Um, and no major adverse events were noticed. Senescent cell markers decreased in the tissue biopsies of these patients. So they were able to show a decrease in senescent cells. Another very important point uh, when we administer uh, senolytics, we usually administer them for short courses. These are usually three-day courses. You know, it's not ongoing. You're not using this continuously. You probably, eventually, you probably eliminate sufficient cells. So this is just cyclical in, in nature. As was, uh, those were the BGAL staining of the biopsies, and basically what they showed was a decrease in senescent cells uh, in these patients. This was another study, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Again, interesting. We know it's a condition that's very challenging, not many options. And it's, it's very interesting because we have studies both on senolytics and on therapeutic plasma exchange to help with pulmonary fibrosis. So in, in pulmonary fibrosis, they did the satinib 100 milligrams, quercetin 12, 1250. Uh, again, three days, the only difference was this, they repeated for a total of three, three doses. So it was nine total doses of the uh, senolytic combination. Uh, they had 14 participants. It was a small study. What they found was they had one major adverse event reported. There was statistically significant meaningful improvements in walking distance. They fatigued less. Uh, gait speed and chair stand time. So these are some of the tests that are used uh, to evaluate these patients. Um, uh, function tests, chemistries, and everything else remained essentially unchanged. So, you know, they saw clinical improvement. It was a bit inconclusive in terms of the actual SAS factors, but um, it was still beneficial. There was another one, the satin of quercetin. Um, this was also 2019, 64 patients. Placebo control, these were patients who had, other than being sedentary, they had no other major illnesses or anything. Um, the satinib, 50 milligrams, it was a lower dose, and quercetin, 500. They did this for five days. Uh, they noticed improved physical endurance after the treatment. Uh, so they showed some benefits, it was well tolerated. Usually, you know, when you do satinib, when you use the satinib, at the 100 milligram dose, you have a higher percentage of patients that can present with side effects. Um, even though it's a short course, it's only three days. But still, when you do the lower doses, 50 milligrams, it's much, much more tolerated. Um, sorry, let me go back. So from the combination, from the combination of clinical and preclinical data, we've seen a couple of things. One, a decreased markers of senescent cells improved exercise and physical parameters, both clinical and preclinical, uh, improved cognition, increased health span and lifespan, decreased amounts of liver fat, uh, improved endothelial functioning, and decreased plaque. So, I mean, quite a few benefits. It's, it's very interesting. Let's look at the risks. Um, so what did the studies say? Well, um, there was an increased risk of some <clears throat> events cardiovascular ischemic effects, uh, hematologic toxicity, pleural effusions. But again, most of these side effects were relatively mild and tolerated. Most of the times what patients will probably experience if they experience side effects, it's not, not everyone experiences side effects, but if they do, they'll probably experience either GI, you know, nausea, uh, diarrhea and stuff, or just like uh, flu-like symptoms. They feel tired, they feel like they're coming down with a cold. So those are the most common side effects with patients. Um, and again, this was the, the, the actual side effects reported in the clinical data, in the clinical studies, were done with really sick patients. So that's also something to consider. Most of, you know, most of the patients you might consider uh, using with this were not, are not, probably will not have pulmonary fibrosis or chronic kidney disease or whatnot. So um, just things to look at. Fisetin, 
comes from the strawberry. Well, it's, it's, it's present in multiple different um, plants, but it, it's a high concentration in strawberries. It's a flavonoid a type of polyphenol. It, it's also a, a CERT activator, so CERT2 inactivator. Uh, Fisetin does that much like resveratrol, although, although probably, probably better. Um, and it's similar in structure to quercetin. Okay. Um, you know, in, in lab studies, obviously, these are lab studies, fisetin has been the most, so far, the most effective natural, natural senolytic uh, study. So it's, it's beaten just a lot of these. Let me see if I have it there. No, it's not here. But it's, it's, it's in beaten resveratrol, quercetin, and all the others as a standalone therapy. Potential is pretty good. You got it there. Yeah, it's EGCG, luteal and fisetin resveratrol, quercetin. So fisetin was the one that decreased senescent cells the most. Uh, mice fed fisetin late in life, lived 15% longer, and controls. That's, that's pretty significant. They also noticed increased glutathione production. And again, this is just from adding fisetin to the diet. And these were old mice. So that's actually pretty significant for, for a study. Um, in vitro, it was shown to in decrease senescent cell uh, and also increase apoptosis. So the, those are two things we want, and they go hand in hand. Um, the average, for those of you that are thinking about eating pounds and pounds of strawberries now, I thought about it. I was like, yeah, I like strawberries. I might eat a few of those. Um, the average amount of fisetin in a strawberry is about 160 micrograms per gram. So that's like, I mean, I, I did the math once. You'd probably have to eat like 50 pounds a day or something. Um, so the actual dosing, based on what we know so far, is probably around 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams uh, on two consecutive days. So same thing. Senolytics are usually cyclical in nature. So just one or two days of fisetin in that way should have a, yeah, that, that, that's 40 pounds of strawberries. That was it. So. Um, that should have the, that should reach that effect. You know, and we have some patients that we're doing fisetin on and we're doing the assays, so hopefully we'll have more, more data on that um, and how it's impacting the senescent cell burdens in these patients. Um, let's talk about something else, something very important that is related to senolytics, NAD. Most of you know what NAD is. Some of you administer it IV. Uh, a lot of you know that our body needs NAD, uh, and NAD levels go down with age. So as we age, NAD goes down, and there's multiple different uh, strategies to increase NAD. So one of the things we're doing mostly is using NAD precursors, NR or NMN, and these are supplements. You take them, they increase NAD levels. It's been studied. The guys at Harvard, Elysium Health, have done some studies in other centers, and they know that these precursors will increase your NAD levels, and that translates into benefits. So it's definitely something that we need to look at when we talk about aging. What are we doing with NAD? Um, so the only thing is that, you know, and, and I, I use NAD a lot in my practice, but the only thing is that there are some studies that have shown that, you know, if you give NAD um, to, you know, and then there's a high burden of senescent cells, they might use that to their advantage and survive a little more. So something you know, similar to, to cancer cells in that they're just trying to find ways to not die. They don't want to die. So one strategy would be if you're going to start patients on an NAD regimen, um, consider evaluating uh, senescent cell burden and potentially giving a short course of senolytic therapies before you get them committed to long-term NAD replacement. Um, just in case, I mean, you would like to, you would do probably well by eliminating um, the, the senescent cells beforehand. And that's the study I was talking about. NAD may drive, NAD metabolism may drive pro-inflammatory pro, pro SASP uh, potential in senescent cells. Um, so again, it, it was one study. Uh, there's other studies that say that if you give NAD and then you do senolytics, you can probably eliminate them more effectively. I mean, you know, I, 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 th I think, you know, senolytic treatments are short courses. So if a patient can do a senolytic therapy a few days and then start, I think that makes a lot more sense, just on the safe side. 
Um, then we have another one. It's a peptide, FOXO DRI. It's a type of protein that controls gene expression, FOXO activation blocks, P53 induced apoptosis. What's interesting is uh, studies have shown that FOXO is very, very selective for killing senescent cells. Okay? And uh, the good and the bad news is um, this was a study using uh, control versus uh, FOXO administration in vitro, and it just dramatically just targeted s s senescent cells, left the healthy cells alone. So it seems like a really interesting strategy, really good strategy to address senescent cells. Um, the only problems with FOXO is technically, technically you could get it from, from a compounding pharmacy. Um, it's very expensive, and it is quite expensive to do. And, you know, and we still, I think, from, from the other options, I mean, it, it, we have basic data, quite strong basic data, but the clinical data on FOXO is still lacking. I know there's some centers starting some, some studies, but we still don't know that. Now, what are or would be the targets and benefits of applying senolytics? If you were to you know, evaluate your patients and talk to them and say, you know, I think we should do senolytic therapies, what would be the benefits of that? So a couple of things is you could see improvements, simultaneous improvements in comorbidities. Um, definitely you would be addressing and delaying aging, maintaining cellular quiescence so the cells can still, they don't go that route of uh, senescence, they can still maintain a replicative potential. Um, you might be able to impact otherwise fatal conditions depending on the patient. Um, and you know, and you can also, there's some strategies that looking at treating localized senescence. I mean, that's a bit more specific and challenging, but still. And then frailty, of course. Um, we know a lot of these diseases have been impacted by aging. Um, and again, this is a sort of like a summary of, you know, different target organs, conditions that have been studied or addressed uh, with the use of senolytics. So we have quite a few of these, diabetes, cardiac dysfunction, sarcopenia, glaucoma and such. So again, it just makes, you know, it makes a lot of sense that if we are eliminating dysfunctional cells, the body should start achieving a, a bit of a repair capacity. Uh, these are some of the studies um, out there uh, on senolytics, randomized clinical trials. I think there may be some additional ones, but most of them have been the, the satin of quercetin. There's some studies on fisetin, some studies on FOXO, and some other novel compounds. There's, it's an attractive space for biotech, so there's a few companies out there trying to develop their own senolytic compounds. So it, it gets interesting, but I mean, we have data. We have some data there. Um, points incorporating senolytics into your practice. What do you need to consider? Evidence, patient selection, laboratory findings, and regulatory status. The clinical evidence definitely favors, I mean, right now favors the satin and quercetin as a combination. You could consider a long-term metformin therapy as low dose uh, as part of the support aspect. Um, fisetin, you can always give it. I mean, it's definitely safe, can be done, and uh, we're not sure exactly how much it will impact, but it's a polyphenol, it should be good. Um, patient selection. You know, who are you going to give this to? Um, obviously, it seems that the urgency would be with the older patients, more advanced patients. Um, and, you know, that would be probably the ones that you might need to be more aggressive in terms of dosing or cycles. Younger patients, I mean, usually don't have uh, an issue with senescent cell burden yet, although there may be a possibility of at some point considering short-term preventive strategies there. Um, like I said, laboratory findings, you know, the BGAL assay is probably one of the best. Um, there's other cytokines that can be looked at in, in plasma. You know, and there's some simple studies that you can always do to see where maybe your patients are at. You can check, for example, you can do a CD4, CD8 ratio that's been studied clinically in older populations, and uh, uh, inversion of the CD4, CD8 ratio predicts mortality in elderly patients. So you have anyone with a CD4, CD8 ratio of less than one, that's actually bad, and you might want to address that. So um, there are some simple labs that we can consider, but some of the other labs are not ready for prime time yet. Regulatory status, I mean, we're giving patients an FDA-approved drug if we're doing the DQ combination and a nutraceutical, so they're both legal, you can prescribe them. 
you explain, obviously, you're doing this off-label, and you know, uh, we're doing this to address certain aspects. Inform the patient, you can have them sign a waiver, and then you can decide on that. So in conclusion, I mean, aging is definitely characterized by a accumulation of senescent cells. We know that senolytics, senotherapeutics are an option and, and are extremely interesting in the field, and I think it's going to continue to be used. Um, currently available drugs and nutraceutical can, can target senescent cells. We can eliminate senescent cells. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this in the future, more compounds, uh, more effective, safer, and so on and so forth. So, um, but it's definitely a start. We've been, I've been treating patients with senolytics for, I don't know, over two, three years now. Um, who knows, maybe more. And uh, definitely there is a population for that, and you know, there are treatments for that. So uh, 